Let's cue the music and start that word chat. Hey, it's been a little while since we've heard that song. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I'm glad to see such a, a, a great crowd here. Uh, you haven't forgotten us over the summer, and we're we're still doing this. Uh, COVID, you know, maybe it's over, maybe it's uh, lingering, but uh, we're still uh, going to keep doing the show and inviting you in. We've got a couple of great shows coming up. Uh, we've got Daniel Human next month. Um, uh, I think October, we're not quite, we haven't quite settled, but we've got our friend Minyan Fogarty coming back uh, in November. Um, so we're going to keep doing this monthly. And today we have uh, a, a really, really cool guest, Jeff Jarvis, who has uh, his latest book, newest book. He's also got an upcoming book, but his latest book is uh, The Gutenberg Parenthesis. Uh, the Age of Print and Lessons for the Age of the Internet. And we're going to ask him all about that. Jarvis is the Toe Professor for Journalism Innovation at City University of New York's Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. So big, long business card there. Uh, he's uh, the, the man, he's got amazing uh, a book coming out this fall, uh, Object Lessons and Elegy to the Magazine. And uh, he has he comes to us from uh, experience in sort of the, the beginnings of of moving uh, publications and discourse onto the internet um, with advanced.net. Um, and he started uh, um, epicurious.com. He was founding editor of, of uh, Entertainment Weekly, Sunday editor of the New York Daily News. TV critic at New York Times, uh, sorry, uh, TV Guide and People. So he's he's done it all. Uh, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. And just to be uh, one clarification is I didn't start yeah. uh, Epicurious because I don't know how to cook. I got to watch as the process went on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but and, and I I hesitate to say this in a group of uh, established and esteemed editors, but I used to be a copy editor. Um, and oh, so well. you will look at my writing all the more critically now. No, no, no. We'll, 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 we will we'll feel more uh, uh, empathy when we do, because we all make uh, embarrassing mistakes when we hold ourselves up as professionals. Um, and we're not a critical crowd. This is a very laid back uh, hour. And uh, we ask people from the um, our guests in the room to ask questions if they wish. And uh, Heather is our um, our producer is uh, is will field those and hand those over. But uh, um, I feel like, uh, so I, we haven't talked because you, you had a, you said you had a, a faculty meeting just before coming here. So we've we're just sort of getting to know each other for the first time. I have, uh, my background, uh, is in, uh, is in newspapers. We both left the Newhouse family at the same time in 2005. I came to uh, Columbus, Ohio, but I was at the Grand Rapids Press before that. So I was there for the early stages of M Live and uh, and sort of taking things onto the internet. So I'm gonna, I, I, so I have no end of questions for you. Um, but starting out, let's see. So the, I, I read that the, the Gutenberg Princess is great title, not original, right? But um, so t tell me, what, what does that mean? And, and, and I guess my first question is, is it fair to call, is it fair to call it a parenthesis? Is it, is it clearly uh, a delineated, delineated uh, era that we're moving beyond now? Or is it sort of, is it more fuzzy than that? But let me get your take on that. So the Gutenberg parenthesis is a lovely theory and conceit that comes from three academics at the University of Southern Denmark, Tom Pettit, Lars Ole Sauerberg, and Marion Borch, in which they contend that the era of print uh, uh, is an exception in history. By the way, 
Um, Pettit is careful to say that, that in the UK, they consider parenthesis what is inside, whereas in the US, we consider parenthesis the symbols. So he means that he's Brit, so he means it in the, in the, in the UK sense. <laughs> um, and, um, and Pettit, by the way, is a medievalist. And so he believes that we, in essence, have a, a chance to return to uh, ways of thinking that come before print. Um, and so my interpretation of that was to look at the lessons that might be learned from society's entry into the age of print as we now leave it for whatever follows. And I'm not saying that print dies, though it might well in newspapers and magazines cases. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that the book dies. Uh, but I am saying that we can be additive toward the lessons we learned in the age of print. We can examine what it meant to be in the age of print, what the presumptions of print were. And as we make decisions now for the age of the internet and data and, and the connected world, uh, I think that there are many lessons to be learned over that vast uh, span of time in the parenthesis. Is it a parenthesis or not? That's for everyone to decide and debate. I think there are uh, multiple parentheses here. Uh, there's a parenthesis of print. There's also a parenthesis of mass media. Uh, mm -hmm. Mass media didn't come until the mechanization and automation of print. I mean, I, one thing I always tell students is I hold up uh, a piece of, of type. For those of you on video can see me holding up one letter. And it's mm -hmm. awe-inspiring for me to think that every word in every language that was set in type was set one letter at a time for more than <laughs> 400 years until we came to another prop. Uh, the um, matrix, the mold for the linotype machine. That's set yeah. type, sorry, last prop, a line at a time. And um, leading to, alongside the um, steam-powered press and paper from pulp and stereotyping and the linotype uh, leading to mass media. And I think mass media um, is itself a parenthesis that we we find ourselves at the beginning of it uh, starting in the late 19th century and i think the internet kills the mass media business model with the mass media with it, the idea and the insult that is the mass so that's another parenthesis mm -hmm. there's a parenthesis around magazines and their lives so i think there's many that one could interpret mm -hmm. so uh so mass media is something that um and we start out with it's not mass media because it's still even in the early stages of printing it, it's expensive it's it's uh it's a lot of bibles um it's something that you're um the rich people can have on their shelves and then of course we soon get into this era of magazines pulp magazines newspapers um but what happened in the 20th in the in the previous millennium of the 20th century of 50 years ago we saw that sort of unwind and uh, the, the, the internet is supposed to be this place where uh, there is no central control and everybody does their own thing and, uh, and you have Twitter and, and Facebook. And it, but is, that, is, is the mass media dead or is it, are we sort of being, I mean, if we think of what is the internet now, there are very few large entities that still are sort of the gatekeepers. Well, I, I think we changed scale. Um, before the mechanization and industrialization of print, the average circulation of a daily newspaper in the United States was 4,000. It was a good substack newsletter. Uh, and then obviously it expanded yeah. and exploded to hundreds of thousands and millions. And, and the scale fundamentally changed. But the scale of mass media was, of course, that you had to make one product for all and convince everybody that it was good for all. I have back there on my bookshelf a directory of, of newspapers in the United States at 1900, and there were scores in New York. And of course, now uh, there are few. Um, and um, I think the age of trying to, with broadcast as well, trying to sell the same product to everybody ends. The paradox of scale online with Google and Facebook, it is, it's, it's the rule of, it's the law of networks. The larger they are, the more they enable small, the more they enable um, a, a, a company like Google to know you individually, to enable small communities to come together, to enable mm -hmm. Substack newsletters for 4,000 people to be a success, um, that it is only because of that scale that it enables that new, new, new uh, sense of scale again. But I don't think we've yet begun to rethink media in those terms, so that we still think that if we talk to Twitter, we're talking to hundreds of thousands of people, or we're talking to Facebook, we're talking to 3 billion people. Well, no, Zuckerberg said to right. me years ago that we only, uh, no two people on earth ever see the same Facebook. 
um, we're very much into uh, a different scale, I think, than we presume still in media. Hmm. Interesting. Well, and that brings up uh, sort of this. I, I find it interesting that is, as X, formerly Twitter, is diminished, um, you still see uh, people making, politicians making announcements, uh, news being reported, um, when really it's never been that big. It's more sort of the place that things are said and then it's reported on elsewhere and that reaches the masses. Um, but there, I, there's not really a question there, but uh, let's talk about X for a minute. Is it, uh, is it, have we seen, is it, you know, is it going to crash and burn further? Is it, is it, is it, or is, is it going to survive because people don't know what else to do? I think that Elon Musk has, has taught us an important lesson and it's one that I wish I had learned. I, I wrote a, a book called What Would Google Do? in which I I saw the, uh, speaking of scale, the necessity I thought at the time for a major investment in internet and trying to build the infrastructure that we have. But the mistake clearly is that we put public discourse in the hands of one company that could be bought by one nihilistic narcissist, uh, Musk. And that teaches us the lesson. It taught Jack Dorsey a lesson too, who said it was a mistake to make Twitter into a company. Uh, in February, I held a, a Black Twitter summit at my school convened by four leading scholars of Black Twitter. We also had in the room one of the original coders of Twitter. And he tried to propose a federated structure like Mastodon at the time, mm. but the board wouldn't stand for that because the board wanted to own it. Uh, and now we have, uh, supposedly uh, we have definitely federated mechanisms like Mastodon and ActivityPub. Uh, Blue Sky funded by Dorsey when he was still at Twitter is supposed to be federated. Threads and Facebook is supposed to be federated. And I hope we've learned a lesson that we should not um, allow these important assets to sit in one hand. But at the same time now, as AI grows to be the next um, hype and, and uh, moral panic at the same time, we see European regulators talking about trying to stop them from having open source versions, which means that the big guys will become only more powerful. So we've got a lot of discussion to have about what it means to have an open internet. Yeah. Uh, so where are you now doing your social media? Pretty much everywhere. Uh, I, I'm still on uh, Twitter and I refuse to fucking call it X uh, because I, um, there are communities there that have not found a home elsewhere. And I think we have to, uh, yeah. I don't want to be part of white flight uh, away from Twitter, but I'm cautious. Uh, I like blue sky a fair amount, but it's small still and just opening up bit by bit. I'd love Mastodon. It's small, but that doesn't matter. The, 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 back to this question of scale. It was not very long at all in a Mastodon that I found enough people to have great conversations with there. Uh, more mm. academics than I was involved with. I, I have a, book history wonks list on Twitter this is my, my happy place. Um, <laughs> a lot of those scholars are now on, on Mastodon. Um, Threads is a bit of a shrug. Uh, like others, I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm trying to sell a book. So that's why I'm there. So yeah, I'm pretty much everywhere. Uh, TikTok, I should be. I, I love watching TikTok. I'm fascinated that TikTok is a truly collaborative platform, which I think is new. Uh, but uh, I haven't made much in the way of TikToks. Uh, not much in the way of Instagram either. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned this uh, a black Twitter summit and, and white flight from Twitter. So is this is this a, this is a, a problem that uh, the black community doesn't have a uh, something to replace their presence on Twitter? There are two scholars I turn to, well, four scholars I turn to for the event. One is Andre Brock Jr. who wrote the book Distributed Blackness, which I recommend highly. And a prequel, an accidental prequel of sorts is a black software by um, Charlotte McElwain at NYU. Uh, Brock is at, is at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, McElwain's book is about the earlier efforts at black community online. Meredith Clark at Northeastern has a book coming out, I think this year from Oxford University Press on black Twitter. And then the fourth scholar who put together the event is uh, Jonathan Flowers. So I turn to them. Um, and and uh, Andre Brock Jr says pretty clearly that too much work went into creating what exists on Black Twitter um, uh, to leave it. I watched a fascinating process happen on Mastodon where Jonathan Flowers was, where they, he would talk about the need for retweets, quote tweets, 
as part of the call and, and, and respond uh, culture that, that Twitter had had that they wanted to bring into Mastodon. Also, search is important mm. so people could find each other. For various reasons, Oigan Rochko, the founder of Mastodon, uh, didn't have those two affordances because he didn't want to uh, encourage bad behavior uh, through them as it happened on Twitter. And then discussions ensued. And I watched this fascinating discussion between Jonathan Flowers at um, UC Irvine, no, UC Northridge, I think, um, talking about the needs for these things. And one of the Mastodon geeks, uh, a former MTV VJ, uh, tried to sh shoot him down and say, eh, this is open source, you make your own then. Which as Flowers then said was, well, that's the geek's way to just say, fuck off. And um, the welcome for other experiences and other value was not great on Mastodon because they were being overwhelmed by folks who came from Twitter and so on and were resistant, but they were also resistant and not welcoming to black Twitter. Mm -hmm. Blue Sky at first did a better job of it and um, invited people who used their trust to invite more people. But then when someone, I think more than one person used the N word in a username, uh, Blue Sky didn't uh, act soon enough. So there was a lack of trust there. So I think that um, it's still a problem. And, and it's not yeah. easy to move a community. It's easy to move as an individual and I can find other friends and find other people there. Uh, as a kid, I move schools all the time. It was the new kid. <laughs> One can do it on social media, but to move a community, that's not easy. Yeah. Is, is this, is sort of this Twitter-like experience uh, where we would expect the discourse to happen uh, because, you know, nobody thought of Twitter 20 years ago. Uh, we thought that we thought, OK, the Internet, the Web is going to allow us to communicate with each other. And then Twitter was sort of a way to do it. Or, 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 and Facebook, of course, also. Is there is there something else in the wings or? Oh, I think there'll be much more in the wings. Uh, I mean, I, I started blogging after 9-11. I was at the World Trade Center uh, and survived, obviously, that day and decided to blog. And that changed my view of media itself. Um, because when people wrote about what I wrote about and linked to me and I linked back to them, I saw that here was a here was a conversation happening in different places at different times. And it's the proper way to think of media as, as a conversation in my view. And it changed my career and my life um, and led to this book and, and other things that I do. So I think that conversation more than content becomes the organizing principle of where we head and Twitter didn't think it was going to be a newswire of the world. Uh, right. When I talked to uh, Ed Williams for a prior book, um, he said that that uh, they never anticipated that, but that's what it became. Uh, Facebook was intended to, you know, help you get dates or whatever. It it it, it didn't it didn't um, uh, anticipate, I think, what it would become. And so that's the essence of the de definition of a platform is when your users put uses to what you invented that you didn't anticipate, then they take it over and it's theirs. And that's a good thing to happen, uh, sometimes yeah. scary. Um, as I mentioned, TikTok, I think is more collaborative. Um, uh, I, I think there'll be, I think what we're gonna see on the federated platforms is the ability to pick your own uh, algorithms and your own recommendation schemes. Uh, I argue in the Gutenberg parenthesis that we've got to get past just trying to play whack-a-mole with bad content and find the mechanisms, the institutions, create the institutions to help discover and nurture and recommend authority and trust and quality and artistry. Um, and that's what happened in print. The first reflex was to, oh my God, there's bad shit going on here. We gotta do something about it. Uh, in 1470, Niccolo Perotti, a translator, demanded of the Pope the appointment of a censor to approve things before they were printed because he was offended by a translation of Pliny that he found shoddy. Uh, but what he was really doing was anticipating the creation of the institutions of editing and publishing that would follow and that would work pretty damn well for half a millennium, but they are not adequate to the scale of speech now. So what are the new institutions that we create? Or can we imagine recreating publishing and editing and journalism uh, as different services in this different time with different needs? Well, so I, I, I'm curious how this how this works. So now let me let me back up a little bit. You're uh, you were with uh, Advance.net, which was uh, the the new house new house newspapers and Condé Nast magazines. Um, it's their early foray into uh, going to the internet, going online. 
Um, I, I didn't realize until probably reading something in your biography that advanced.net uh, also owned or owned Reddit. Uh, I don't think still, maybe still do, um, which, which is, you know, to me, Reddit is a very disorganized, loose community of really user driven. Um, and what it is, if I'm curious about this whack a mole thing, um, if if we don't whack them all, and somebody uses the N word in a in a in a, a handle, um, blue sky, and you don't get to it for forty eight hours, what you know what what is the <laughs> what's the alternative to whack a all? I guess. Um. So by the way, I fail. I, I work for Steve Newhouse directly, and I failed him a few times. He wanted early introductions to Facebook, and I didn't manage that. He loved mm -hmm. Dig and wanted that, and Reddit was kind of a, a consolation prize. Dig is dead. Um, <laughs> he bought Reddit after I left, and uh -huh. um, it's going public, I think, again soon. Um, and one day he called me and said, there's bad stuff going on in Reddit, and what do we do? And I said, I don't have necessarily have a solution. Um, and my answer is not going to be satisfactory. Part of what we need to learn to do is to ignore things, um, to try to think that we can get rid of all bad speech. The, even the idea of bad speech, the idea of harmful speech gives me shivers uh, because who is to decide what is bad speech and harmful speech and who is to decide what is official speech or true speech? Um, I, I'm not crazy about that. And I'm not a libertarian. I'm a Joe Biden Democrat. I'm, um, I think that the platforms have responsibility to uh, have a North Star and make decisions. And those decisions and judgments are not inexpensive, uh, but they owe us that environment or we leave them. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's a free for all. I'm not saying that I, by any means that I ever agree with Elon Musk, uh, but I am saying that we're always going to have bad actors doing bad things. And we've got to figure out um, uh, how to turn our attention to rewarding the good. Uh, that's not a satisfactory answer. It doesn't answer everything. But I think right now, especially since 2016 and Trump and Brexit, uh, we've been concentrating on just disinformation and fake news and bad stuff. Um, and we're never going to eliminate it. And so we have to admit that and then figure out where to go next. And mm -hmm. I think that if you had the, the choice of different filters and algorithms on social media, um, you know, Trump is on Mastodon, but no other federated um instance of mastodon wants to link to him except for a few <laughs> bad things. so he's there but to the rest of mastodon he might as well not exist uh -huh. that's one model right interesting uh we have uh, as we said if you have any questions uh for jeff or, Jarvis, or challenges uh, or arguments or oh yeah or absolutely corrections or anything please <laughs> absolutely uh let us know uh amy fast had a couple of uh questions that were kind of of a technical nature. Amy, are you uh, available to ask us in the room? Uh, yes, I think I actually need to, to well, except for the one, I uh, used the word federated, um, and I, I didn't understand what the implications of that are. Sure. Um, and, and, and this context. <laughs> It confuses people. Uh, if you're curious about Mastodon, I have two posts on jeffjarvis.medium.com. I can send you. Um, oh, it's yes, it's needlessly confusing. <laughs> but uh, what it is simply is it's open source. And so um, I can start a server tomorrow and run my own version of Mastodon. And you can have your version of Mastodon. And Mark can have his version of Mastodon. <laughs> and we, we can have people, we can have our own rules and our own structures. Because it's federated, if uh, Heather comes in and joins Mark's instance of Mastodon, she could also follow me on mine and you on yours because they are all connected together. However, if Mark decides that I'm evil and my instance is horrible, he can defederate me. He can choose not to allow his users to come to me. Now his users can protest and say, well, screw that, no, Mark. Uh, I want to follow these wonderful people that Jarvis has so they can take their social graph and move entirely, Amy, to your instance. <laughs> it's portable, huh. right? So that the idea here is that like the internet, no one can own it all. No one can control it all. That's not a solution for everything, but it is a very appealing model after the lessons of Musk. And, and oh, yeah. so yeah. 
of uh, activity pub is a larger protocol. There's a wonderful post I recommend by Mike Masnick, uh, or not a post. It was, it was an article, um, called, uh, 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 protocols over platforms, I think, or protocols, not platforms. And in a platform, a company owns it. In a protocol, it's a standard that you can follow. Email is a protocol and you can choose who your email provider is and it works with other email. The same thing should well be true around around a social. I hope that makes some modicum of sense. Um, some. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a confusing thing. I think that's one reason people don't, haven't gone to Mastodon in droves. I, I, I hear from a lot of people who I knew on Twitter who go to Mastodon and say, I just don't get it. It's not, I'm not comfortable with it. And I think about the early stages of Twitter when you know, I was following 50 people and tw two people were following me. And, you know, it's it's sort of like that where you say, well, how do I get to know these people? Um, and I think it is maybe it's a little bit harder to find people on. But there's on other interesting things. There's there's lists of people. Um, uh, and this is in my posts and I can send it to you. Mm -hmm. There are yeah. academics in various fields. and There are lists mm -hmm. of academics of anthropologists on Mastodon. And so you can start following them and follow who they follow. It's what, as you said, uh, Mark, it's what we had to do in the early days of Twitter. It's just we're spoiled now from having had a ready-made community of people. Right. So uh, let me get back to the beginnings of, of your experience with um, the internet uh, moving, you know, and you, you, your, your background is print, and then you move to uh, the internet. What? How did that happen? Let's start with that. How did... Uh, did did you have a vision? Did you have a desire? What uh, what moved you into that? So I wrote a, the first chapter I wrote for the Gutenberg parentheses. I was blocked and I couldn't figure out where to start. So I started with what was going to be an interregnum uh, that I ended up killing, but it was a, a a typographical autobiography, and it begins when I was working on Chicago Today, a paper that had no tomorrow, that was owned by Chicago Tribune uh, when I was still at Northwestern. And they started installing these computers. And this is 1973, 1974. I'm that old. And, but I started young, let me be clear. I was still in college. 14, um, yeah. And um, so they started installing these computers and everybody was scared of them and didn't know what to do. It was like 2001 the Space Odyssey. They're, 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 they're from the obelisk. But I was young and stupid and I was on the midnight shift waiting for somebody to die a horrible death so I could write about it. So I played with a computer. And I came to day shift as a assistant city editor, and I was the one person who wasn't scared of the computer in the newsroom. I didn't realize it was a scab system meant to kill the International Typographical Union. But being young and naive, I ended <laughs> yeah. up training the newsroom on the computer. And this is the days when I had to explain the concept of a cursor, right? And explain mm -hmm. that you don't hit return at the end of a line. And you know, it was, it was kind of a charming time of introducing people to computers. And I came to like the technology. I have San Francisco Examiner. I was the geek in the newsroom at Time Inc. I was the geek in the newsroom. When I started Entertainment Weekly, my wife, uh, Tammy Westmark, set us up on the first major Macintosh network uh, to produce a magazine, which we produced uh, entirely on Macintosh, not on Atex. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was the geeky beginnings of this, right? And, and I ended up on, uh, I bought up my own computer in 1981, an Osborne one which I've donated to the Museum of Printing in Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is a place I recommend to you all. And uh, I got on to CompuServe and I found this world of talking to people about topics and it was absolutely fascinating to me. And so ever since then, I was involved in it and liked it. And I worked for TV Guide as TV critic and was gonna go to work for Advance and they said, no, 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 we just bought this thing called Delphi Internet, you should go do that. And I went there and it was a cluster F of monumental proportion. And I left after only a month and went to Newhouse. But it was, it was, a, it was the first company to connect people to the uh, internet. And at that time in October, 1994 was the introduction of the browser to the public, which I mark as the real beginning of the popular internet. And I was at advance as they were deciding, should we do Prodigy? Should we do AOL? Should we do this new thing? And I, among mm -hmm. others said, do this new thing because it's, it's wholly different. And um, so that was my start then on, on becoming an online guy. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, so now, so you're, so you're there at the beginning, obviously. Um, 
so you've and then and you've turned into sort of an observer of of how things are going. So uh, so what did you expect in those early days in the 1990s, early you know, 1990s, I guess, and in that maybe didn't turn out the way you expected? Oh, oh lots. Um, but I guess I first should give tribute to my boss and formerly your boss, Steve Newhouse, who understood that the essence of the internet was not content. And here he had the access to Condé Nast and all these newspapers. And mm -hmm. he fundamentally understood that it was about conversation and community and pushed me in that way. And I went obnoxiously overboard then uh, in that direction. And um, so we had forums and we had comments and we didn't realize at first that community, you can't just put community up and expect it to go fine that people will do bad right. things and you have to invest in that community and you have to figure that out. Um, Steve also, for, it was actually for labor reasons, as, as you know, having worked in the company, that the online was completely separate from print because they didn't yeah. want the labor conditions of print to accrete to the online employees. It worked out the opposite in the end, but that's another story. Um, uh -huh. But as but Steve also said, Steve Newhouse also said that that if we had handed the internet to the print editors, they would have just put up PDFs and they wouldn't have had conversation mm. and they wouldn't have enabled the websites to find their own value and their own relationship. And I learned a lot from him in that way. Surprises, there were many and there still are. Um, uh, you know, I didn't think that Twitter would become the power that it was or that it would get taken over and ruined. Um, uh, I wrote a fanboy book about Google called What Would Google Do? So I, I still think that they're pretty amazing, but I, I didn't kind of anticipate their loss of momentum. Um, um, I probably should have anticipated the moral panic in media about the internet, but didn't. Hmm. Uh, the moral panic in media um, from the from the from those who are institutional or yeah, I think that, that uh, this is this is a next book that I'm hoping is coming out next year with basic uh, is, is basically about that is about media's relationship to the internet. Um, and it's a critique of it because just as there were moral panics about novels and books and television and radio and uh, comic books and video games, uh, there is a moral panic today about social media and about our phones and now about AI. And um, the problem with that is that it is a simplification, an oversimplification of larger problems and trends. And when, when media try to blame everything on one folk devil, in this case, the internet or Mark Zuckerberg, they're not paying attention to the larger underlying stories and problems that exist. Uh, the internet didn't make us hate. It didn't make us racist. It didn't make him misogynist, us misogynistic. We brought all of that to the internet. The internet is a human enterprise and it reflects mm -hmm. uh, the worst in us alongside the best in us. Okay. Uh, you, you just answered a, a question, a personal question that I had, uh, or partly answered a personal question that I've been wondering maybe for years. And that's, uh, you know, when, uh, when I was at the Grand Rapids Press, and when we decided to do, when we did the internet component, it was MLive, it was based in Ann Arbor, and there was a lot of, there was sort of a disconnect that that really existed. And I, it wasn't necessarily because of that structure, but I often wondered, had the push been at the individual newsroom, would there have been a buy-in more than the sort of this ridiculous resistance, this sort of this, <laughs> this clinging to print that went on for many, many years after that. And I don't know the answer to that. And you, you, you may be, you may be right that it was just so ingrained that we are, in, we are a print. That's our jobs as print, and that this internet is is this fad that is you know the this no man's wilderness. Um, but uh, but I've often wondered if, uh, if 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 we should have done more to get people like me, copy editors, because I was the guy in the newsroom who was always looking at the you know how we could get things into uh, this other medium. And from the beginning, there was a lot of just sort of uh, not just resistance to the 
um, inevitability, but just sort of this, uh, uh, well, a little bit of, you know, uh, the Titanic sinking and we're just going to rearrange the deck chairs. Well, it's a really interesting question about transitions <clears throat> and, and power uh, and, and change management, as, as to put it in that way. Um, not to get too detailed, but it's kind of, uh, you might find this amusing. Um, so at Newhouse, if you were a non-guild, non-union newsroom, they offered what they called a lifetime job guarantee, which was to say a non-economic yes. layoff guarantee. They didn't mm -hmm. want that benefit to accrete to the online divisions because the online divisions, who knows, this could be a flash in the pan, it could be a fad, right. you know, what, what the heck, right? So they insisted upon completely separate companies. But as I said, Steve Nohouse also insisted on it so that advertising would build separate value and editorial uh, would not just take it over. Um, well, come the end of the tale, obviously internet is there forever and it's winning and print is dying. And so what about the lifetime job guarantee? They had to redefine life. It wasn't the life of the employee, it was the life of the newspaper. And when they killed the newspaper, then there went the guarantee. And so mm -hmm. first in Ann Arbor, and I was brought back into the company to work on this, we, um, we, we killed the paper and right. relaunched a different paper vacated the newsroom, opened a new newsroom, hired back some people from print, but not all, hired new people with new talents and said, you people in this new newsroom are 100% fully digital, full stop. That's all you do is digital, everything. 20 miles away was an operation in some of the cities called PubHub, where uh, a few editors were allowed to repurpose print content, I mean, digital content for print, but they weren't allowed to sign journalists and they weren't allowed to assign stories. So thus digital truly led the, the operation and print was the byproduct. Uh, controversial, not necessarily done terribly well in a lot of ways, but it was a forward thinking effort to say, we know where this story ends, how do we get there faster? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'm sure that, you know, hindsight, there's, there's probably no, no way it's a disruptive it's an incredibly disruptive uh thing we've had if, it, if it's if it's the end of the print era then it's very hard to sort of ride that out and manage it and do it in a proper way um yeah and again but, i don't uh, think the print dies entirely at the end of mm -hmm. gutenberg parenthesis i um i recant uh and and what would google do i argued that books um uh, should be updated and, and rethought so they could be updatable and clickable and linkable and discussable and cheaper and all that. And I said uh, an embarrassing quote that um, we had to get over the book. We, it was too sacrosanct and we weren't gonna change it unless we did. Yeah. So then I say, and what would Google do? I recant. And there's a, there's a great line from Umberto Eco. Let's see if I can find it very quickly. Um, me one second here. Who said, uh, the book is like the spoon, scissors, the hammer, the wheel. Once invented, it cannot be improved. And I agree with that. I think the book is an institution that we judge ourselves against now. However, having said that, the next book I've got coming out is about the magazine. And it is an, it turned into an elegy to the magazine because I think the magazine didn't really uh, delve into the opportunities it had to become more about community than content. Mm. And so I think it's hit its, its end and the, and the economics of print magazine. Hell, I, I work in the middle of Manhattan and go try to buy a magazine. Go try to buy a newspaper. Nigh unto impossible. Um, the last reason to print newspapers is the inserts and those are going away. Those are all but gone away. So I think the print newspapers will at least go down to one day a week and will often die. Print magazines, Entertainment Weekly, my magazine, is no longer in print. Uh, they will die more and more and more, but I don't think books will. Hmm. And and magazines? Magazines also are going to shrink. Yeah. Now, magazines are, I mean, there are magazines, magazine websites that, I mean, they, they do the, the magazines have the big glossy photos and, uh, and, and graphics and design, and, and that does translate somewhat to the, to the web. So... Am I am I wrong to think that there's some hope for for that to sort of survive? My hope for magazines, which I think has been dashed, 
was that they would become centers of community and conversation. Instead, they still thought they were temples to Conde. Yeah, right. When I worked at Conde, there was a wise editor at The New Yorker who said, listen, Conde is this tower and we have windows all around. And she said, I, I want to open the windows all around so people can talk directly to each other. But no, right? What the magazine does is still curate. In the research in the magazines, if you look at the, at the, at the so the earliest magazines, Tatler and Spectator in the coffee houses of Habermas's um, uh, public sphere in England uh, were there as part of a conversation. Uh, Harper's at its beginning in, in 1850 had a distinctly curatorial mission. There's so much more good stuff going on now, we're gonna find it for you before it had its own creative mission to create its own content, right? And I think, and then you, you move forward quickly to uh, the 1890s and Frank Muncy realized he could sell magazines at a loss and make it up on advertising and thus has created the attention business model that rules even to the internet today. You go to the 1920s and you see Henry Luce creating magazines as a corporate entity. Um, and so they've had various lives over time. I think what they could have done was to recognize their essence around community, but they didn't. And they could have created Twitter. They could have created Facebook. Mm -hmm. Steve, Steve Newhouse wanted a piece of Facebook because he saw the connection. He wanted to own Dig and bought Reddit because he saw that connection. But trying to make the old work with the new, as you saw in, in newspapers online, was nigh unto impossible. Yeah. Um, well, what did you what did you learn? Uh, there, this is a, a a long sort of history of of print and interesting um, and maybe I don't know maybe a little dry at times, but a, a a very nice history of print and its influence. And what I'm wondering what you learned uh, in researching something like that. So, what struck me most was the timeline of hmm. print. And I'll go through it very quickly. So uh, important to say that uh, movable type was created in, in Korea and China before Germany. And we don't know whether there was any connection to that from that to to Gutenberg and Mainz. But Gutenberg um, in the late 1440s, 1450s, uh, started working on print and the, his Bible came off the press literally in 1454 or thereabouts. The first 50 years, the incunabular or infant age of print uh, was mimicking the scribes. It was only starting in 1500 where we started to see the book take on the shape that we know now with titles, title pages, indexes, uh, or indices if you prefer, um, uh, uh, page numbers, uh, indentation for paragraph, and so on. Around that time too, the business was in shambles. There had been too much investment into the same old books, the ancients for everybody. And it was rescued by Martin Luther, who importantly didn't just decide to print his work, but print it in German. And thus he created Publix and, and spoke to Publix and standardized the language and created a sense of Germanness and a sense of nationhood. Um, so that happens a little more than 50 years past Gutenberg. At 1600, a few years either side of that, the technology fades into the background, as I think will happen with the internet, and we see a tremendous rush of innovation with print. Cervantes and the creation of the modern novel, Montaigne and the essay, Shakespeare and a market for printed plays, the creation of the newspaper in 1605. Um, fast forward a century more to 1710, we finally have a business model for print at long last in copyright, but now conversation, discourse, creativity all become property as a metaphor. Um, 1800s is the first changes in the technology of print as we already discussed, stereotyping, steam powered presses, uh, type city machines, cheap paper from pulp, the new business model that enables mass media. 1920s, we, print sees its first competitor forever in broadcast and radio and then television. And then fast forward to today, well, we're about a quarter century past the introduction of the commercial browser and the popularization of the internet. Uh, that puts us in my reckoning at 1480 in Gutenberg years. And I argue, and some will disagree, that we have time, that the change that we think of as very rapid now could be very slow and just beginning, which is to say for some, maybe it's scarier than we think, 
or maybe we have time to make decisions. And that's why I wrote the book was to say, okay, well, decisions based on what lessons can we learn from the past? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that I think it was important to look at print as a technology because that's how we're viewing the internet as a technology. But in the next book that I'm working on, uh, one sub chapter heading is demote the geeks because I think it's time for us to look past the technologists and bring the humanities into this human enterprise that is the internet. Um, anthropology and sociology and ethics and community studies and history um, and philosophy should have a much greater voice in the decisions that we make around the internet that we are all making together. But are you optimistic that we can humanize the internet in that way? Um, I think it's already human. And a lot of what we blame on technology is our problem. Once again, it didn't make us hate. We brought our hate to it. Um, the things that it's accused of, like creating filter bubbles and echo chambers in research, that's greatly debunked. Um, there's a, a, a researcher, and if you're, if you're curious about this, uh, uh, the filter bubble argument uh, started by um, Pariser, uh, I think has been pretty roundly debunked in a book called Are Filter Bubbles Real by Axel Bruns. There is a researcher in Denmark, again, named Michael Bong Peterson, who said that the filter bubbles that exist are the ones we created in our real lives. If you think back to the book, The Big Sort, that said we were moving into communities where um, we chose to be around people like us in the town, in our jobs, in our houses of worship, in our clubs, and so on. And what the internet does is burst that filter bubble and expose us to the people we're not exposed to in our real lives. And these are people that too often we find to be strange, strangers, we're scared of them, we're made to fear them uh, by politics and discussion. And so the, the internet doesn't create filter bubbles, it counterintuitively, it destroys them and that's the issue, which I find fascinating. Mm. All right. I see Amy has a question, or no, who was it? Karen has a question here about um, AI. Do you want to go? Oh, I missed, I missed one. Karen, are you, uh, are you there? We are running low on time, so if you have questions, uh, right. let us know. And Karen? We, we can ask on her behalf. She okay. was wanting to know, could AI throw a wrench or speed bump in this whole process? I, I'm, I'm glad you, of course, we can't, we can't have any discussion right now without statutorily um, having a discussion about AI, because we just have to. So um, uh, I'm fascinated by it. And even though I tend to defend the internet and defend our freedoms on it and so on, I'm very cautious about, about AI or particularly about generative AI. Because um, I think it's being miscast and misused. I, um, uh, you probably all saw the case of the schmuck lawyer who used ChatGPT to come up with citations. I went personally and covered his show cause hearing in federal court. And he tried to blame the technology and say, I didn't think it was gonna lie to me, what was I gonna do? And the judge was very clear and said, you might've made a mistake in using it in the first place, but when it was called to his attention that these citations could not be found, he doubled down. He went back to ChatGPT, are these real? And it's programmed to tell us what he wants to hear. And he says, yeah. ChatGPT said, yes, it's true. And then he had to create the cases. <laughs> And he said all that in. the problems were human foibles. Yeah. So I'm fascinated by the misuse of AI. News organizations I do not think should be using generative AI to create news stories, except in cases that have been used for years in doing sports stories and financial stories and things that are well proven. Otherwise, mm -hmm. to use uh, large language models is folly and it's going to hurt credibility. Um, and we don't just need more content in the world. We got plenty of content. They have a machine that makes content. I'm fascinated that that a machine that can turn out a credible prose uh, makes writing and writers less special. I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm fascinated mm -hmm. with the idea that AI could, a generative AI could extend literacy that could help people who are intimidated by writing. I'm mm -hmm. special, I'm a writer, but a lot of people are, are frightened to death of writing. And if it could help people tell their stories and express themselves better and illustrate their stories, by the way, I find that fascinating. I've seen other uses that are augmentative I saw, um, and when I visited Google last, a few weeks ago, 
uh, net, Notebook LM, which I think would, would interest all of you, it'll be out later this fall, that you could put in a Google folder and uh, then query your own content, ask questions of it, have it create a glossary, have it summarize things as a way to help you in your writing and help you in your editing. Uh, those, those things I think are very useful. But I don't think that AI, and I, I, I'm very frightened of the faux philosophy espoused by some of these AI boys uh, that they have their their chest thumping that they can destroy the world with their power, uh, I think is um, troubling more than the technology. Yeah, I'm also I would add to that troubled by the uh, you know the bean counters the 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 people who say oh AI we can do this without human intervention let's you know yeah, let's yeah. start laying people off and we'll we'll see what we end up with which which is. You know, same thing if you lay off copy editors, you're going to have more mistakes in your copy. Bingo. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you're, so you've got a book coming out in the fall, uh, Elegy to the Magazine. Uh, you've got a, a book coming out next year. Uh, this is quite a pace. What, how, how, what are, you, are you using uh, ChatGPT to I write your books? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gutenberg took 10 years to do. Um, and... Uh, the magazine is a very, it's a very small, short book, little tiny thing, right? Just for the sake of comparison, size yeah. comparison, so yeah. I can get both in a plug, <laughs> right? One's little. So um, uh, the research for magazine was a lot of fun, but wasn't, you know, huge. And then the internet book is kind of a positive polemic where I have lots of research in there, but it, it doesn't require that much. The book I want to write that I hope to write next is about the linotype. That's really uh. key but it's a fascinating it's, uh, story and its impact on media is also fascinating. It's part of that mass parenthesis. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, really quick. You, I, I don't think I mentioned that you have, uh, you have a, your own uh, website, uh, buzzmachine.com, where we can find your blog and your writings on some of these topics. And then you're, you, uh, and I've only seen a little bit of this, the podcast, This Week in Google. Of course, there's a podcast called This Week in Google. What, what tell us what, what, the, what goes on there? There's a network of podcasts called Twit Network, This Week in Tech, run yes. by Leo Laporte, which is quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I wrote What Would Google Do, he said, should we have a podcast about that? So it's, it's delightful. We've had more than 700 episodes. Wow. And unlike you who are... <laughs> um, uh, economical in your speech. It can go on as long as three hours, uh, <laughs> oddly, but it's a lot of fun to do that. And, and I enjoy it. Um, yeah. and it's a place to sell books these days because selling books uh, has changed itself a lot. Right. Uh, I, you know, we got one more, I think we have time for one more question. I just see Dana has a, a query in there. Maybe we can, uh, get her ask before we go. Certainly. Hey, Thanks for being here and thanks, Jeff, and thanks for taking my question. Are people becoming more tolerant of errors in text? And is that part of how AI has become so popular? What do you think, Dana? That's the New York professor's trick to turn the uh, question, <laughs> into a question, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll to buy myself time, but I'm curious what you think first. Um, I work in a niche category in publishing and I feel like readers will complain about things, but they still devour the books that are not, shall we say, copy edited well. So I feel like there's this general moving away from, well, who cares? <laughs> so I don't know, what have you been seeing? Because you have a broader perspective. Uh, well, that's nice of you to say. Um, I don't. I, it's it's a really interesting question. I think um, that yes, there is more tolerance, and w and so what you're really asking is what's the root of that tolerance? It could be that just there's fewer copy editors and people are getting used to it now, and there's speed online, even in publishing companies, and so um, we kind of recognize it. It could be that surrounded by enough tweets and blogs and all that. I mean, one thing about having been blogging since 2001, I've become editorially feral. I don't take notes well, right? Because I've been able to say whatever the hell I want to say, however I want to say it for all these years now. And uh, I've had good editors, but I have to get over something uh, to deal with that. Um, 
the AI piece is what's interesting to me. I, 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 I post I wrote on Medium um, the other day. I think that um, first, uh, ChatGPT does not lie. It does not hallucinate. It is not made, it does not understand words. It doesn't, has no concept of truth. It is a prediction machine that, that based on all of our words and the relationships among them predicts the mes- most, next most likely word to satisfy a need, but it has no understanding of words. I think that uh, the large language models could have an effect on the reputation of all artificial intelligence. That if I can't trust hmm. this output of the machine in this way, who's to tell the difference between that and another structure? Um, so I think that there, there's a danger for the AI boys that isn't about destroying mankind. It's about destroying their businesses uh, because they're using it wrongly. I don't, think, I don't think it should be used for news. I don't think it should be used for search engines. Witness the schmuck lawyer who thought it was a search engine. Um, and that was his expectation. He saw a blank box. I put in something. His expectation was that it was going to give him back something credible. And he didn't know it could lie, though it wasn't lying. Um, I also think that um, our language has always been flexible, has always developed, has always changed. But I do think that um, the fact that everyone now has a way to speak online makes it change faster. And I celebrate that. I celebrate the extension of literacy, but with it is going to come a loss of um, orthodoxy about a lot of speech. Also emoji, also memes, also jokes, uh, also communities having their own languages and their own expression as a way to do it uh, privately, even under gaze. Uh, young people do this so their parents can't see really what they're talking about on, on Facebook. Um, in China, obviously, it's done to avoid censorship. So language is a beautiful and wonderful and flexible thing that we may look at it to some extent as errors, but we also have alternative facts. Thank you, uh, Trump administration. <laughs> and so who's to say what's an error? And um, uh, yeah, so I don't know where that goes. It's a fascinating question. Yeah, but well, it will be interesting to see. And I think one thing you didn't mention was there's just so much more published now than ever was. And so yes. we have different expectations of of what's published by what we read on Facebook and what's published by in a blog by some guy, a blog by a NYU professor or um, some uh, a blog that's uh, from the New York Times. Um, I, I guess we're, we're, out, we're out of time. This has been fascinating. You said your um, your wife's going to call you for dinner and so we need to get you out of here at a decent time. So we'll do that. And uh, it's been a great hour. Thank you so much for uh, talking with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, there's my email in the chat and uh, uh, happy to continue the discussion uh, anyhow. Thank you all great. very much. Great. Yeah, that's that's Jeff at buzzmachine.com. You can check out uh, some more um, blogs at uh, buzzmachine.com. Uh, next month, we're going to talk more about AI. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll try not to make this a show entirely about AI, but it's going to come up a lot, I'm sure. And uh, Minion Fogarty, uh, Grammar Girl, is going to be back with us in November, which is always a, a pleasure. And uh, December... I don't know. We haven't decided that yet. Something we'll do something fun, uh, but we're going to keep going. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you uh, in a few weeks.